Good morning. <laughs> it's been a couple of weeks, and uh, I'm just in a good, good space. I, I've come off of a place that was not pleasant, and I want to address it today. But I'm going to do a quick full up follow up. So I'm going to do this 33 minutes, talking about what had been going on previously. And then talking about kind of an update to what's transpired in the last couple of days. Uh, the first thing I wanted to say is that uh, I celebrated my eighth anniversary of waking up. Uh, well, it, I checked my notes. It was uh, the last day of April, the first two days of May 2013. So if my math is correct, that's eight years. <laughs> eight full wonderful years. That brings me to this spot where I sit with you at this very moment in time. <laughs> it's funny, I've been really talking about Buddha years again and <laughs> I've done so many of these and something's slipped my mind. And I, I want to talk to you about uh, Buddha years. It's either eight years, I believe it's eight years, uh, but it could have been six. <laughs> but I made it up anyway, so it's not coming from somewhere else. It's coming from my interpretation of what the Spirit, my experience, my interpretation of what came to me, this idea of Buddha years. And I really lean towards the eight. Eight times eight, I'm getting to be a 64-year-old Buddha. At this rate, I'll soon be an older Buddha than I am chronologically. <laughs> Won't take long. Let's do the listing. Eight years and 64 plus eight is 72. Getting close, in two years I'd be 80, and my chronological chronological age will be 74. Ha ha ha! I'm an older Buddha. I'm looking forward to being an older Buddha than a human being. <laughs> um, but I, I just want to go back to th the simple sharing that it's not all honey and roses even after you've awoken. On a, you know, quite frankly, you're relieved of a lot of things. Number one, and most importantly, you're relieved of fear, and particularly the fear of death, when you cons when you really embrace your continuation as a spirit into infinity. And there's a word for that. <laughs> that I'm struggling with. And I'll come back. Let's see how long it takes me to come back to this word. But like I said, it's not all honey and roses. Because <laughs> too much honey is not a good thing. And obviously roses are protected by thorns. So my metaphor is not too far off that, you know, in the process of enjoying the rose, you can't ignore the thorns. In the process of tasting the honey, you can't forget that you can OD on honey. I'm sure you can. You can overdose on anything. <laughs> so having said that, uh, I wanted to, I never like to gloss over, I want to share uh, the times of difficulty and recently, especially as I've been opening my zendo, making myself available to others, to others being in my presence. And fortunately for me, I think fortunately, because I get a little reprieve because these COVID days, people are reluctant to come to my zendo. And I've only had a few strays trickle in who haven't come back. So I go on and I spend the hours that I'm supposed advertise and supposed to spend in my zendo with the door open and I'm available. But 
I've noticed recently that being out and about as little as I, you know, we have to go out and about, and I, I really don't, I keep it to a minimum. Both the virus helps because uh, social distancing is something I've always practiced, and now it's <laughs> mandated. <laughs> It's so funny to me. Staying at home is a joy to me. Being alone is a pleasure. Uh, I have this really wonderful relationship worked out with my wife where she wants to be in Taipei where her parents are and her preference of community. She's a city girl. She's a Taipei girl. So half the time she's in... Uh, Taipei, and half the time she's here with me in Hualien. And it's quite a good compromise because I look forward to the time, I think she does too, that we're together. But at the same time, I think we both secretly, or not so secretly, look forward to the time that we can have some distance and I can go back to my alone time. And she's also loves her alone time. So it's the convenience of Taipei, even though she seldom, she's a homebody, she seldom leaves her a apartment she works online she's entertained online uh, so she doesn't need much more than a good internet connection which you can get almost anywhere but she likes to walk down in the basement of her building the first floor of her building is the 7-eleven there's good suija around the corner uh, there's a variety of foods and she lives in quite a nice area right across the park right across from Chiang Kai-shek Memorial and in that area, there's a day market, there's Costco, I'm not Costco, but Watson's, and there's a, a couple of different uh, supermarkets and a variety of food, and it suits her needs. And it's nothing's farther than a bike ride or the MRT's convenient. Anyway, this is all the pluses of Taipei, but it's not a place for me. So it's interesting how things work out. And I think that puts more vitality, it puts more substance, it puts... Anyway, it's what works for us. And we don't give a rat's ass what other people think, you know. Who cares what somebody else thinks? Even if someone as close and near and dear as my brother and his wife, my sister-in-law, wonder how... Uh, I think they wonder how we can be apart so much. They're together all the time. But anyway, I'm digressing because I wanted to talk about trials and tribulations. And this separation is not a trial or a tribulation. But I just wanted to share it with you because there's other ways to make, there's other ways to look at everything. It's not cookie cutter. One size doesn't fit all. One of my favorite things to tell my brother is he always says, you should eat more fruit. Well, fruit brings my blood sugar up. I'm borderline diabetic. So... You know, oh, you should eat more oatmeal or blah, 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 people. Do, 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 do. The thing I agree on is hydration. I know that it's important that I might not drink enough water in between my wife and my brother. I get constant reminders, but uh, I think hydration is sort of universal. But the rest of everything else, you know, you have to find out what works for you. I can't eat raw vegetables. I love a salad, but most times I load it with a high-calorie ranch dressing or blue cheese dressing or, you know, heavy calorie. To, to, but essentially, the raw vegetable in my gut, just, the system just doesn't handle it. And as I get older, my digestive system certainly been making me aware of it. And I just have to say to everyone else, pay attention to your body. Your body will tell you, never mind what somebody says, never mind the folk wisdom, never mind. Uh, my doctor wants me to take statins, and I refuse to take statins because everything hurts. My back hurts. He says, your cholesterol is too high. Well, I live, on a, my, my, I live on a keto diet, which has been with me for many years. It's high protein uh, and fats. It's very limited to zero carbohydrates so of course my uh, uh, it's understandable that my cholesterol level would be higher and it's also hereditary my family tends to have higher cholesterol levels but now then more and more science that comes out there's not really much link between cholesterol and heart attack which I have to be aware of 
I, there's more of a link in my mind between cholest between the the use the widespread use through this fear mongering of high, of lowering your cholesterol or suffering the consequences it's a monetary it's good for the doctors and it's certainly good for big pharma for the pharmaceutical companies it's a money game anyway i've tried every one i tried them and i said well i feel guilty i gotta listen to my doctor because sometimes he says well you don't listen to me why do you come to me <laughs> good point but i do need my medication i believe in my blood thinner plavix i take a between one and one and a half i alternate half a dose of phonocil and a, a full dose the next day and phonocil Phonosil is the most kind uh, blood pressure medicine that uh, I take. So I need to go renew these prescriptions. So I need to have a relationship. So now when my doctor just talks about, I know I'm having, I'm due for a, a cholesterol test, a blood test before I see him next. And I know he's going to, and I'm just tired of fighting. I'm just going to say, okay, give me the things. And, uh, so, it's very wasteful, but I can't talk them out of it. But I just won't take them. That's all. It's my choice. And my body tells me that I'm better off. I just can't take the back pain, the aches and pains, uh, the, the side effects of statins are insurmountable. And it's easy to get around it. I just had to smile and nod and shut up <laughs> and, do, and do what I want, which has been my MO as long as I can remember. I'm not a confrontational dude. I don't need to tell you no. I just either pretend I don't hear it. Or I probably don't even pretend. I don't listen anymore <laughs> to things that fly in the face of what my body teaches me. Who's to tell me, after 73 years in this body, who's to tell me, who's more qualified to tell me what I should or shouldn't do in terms of feeling correct and taking this, taking responsibility and taking care of this gift of a physical form. So now we're getting, <laughs> I'm having fun. Now we're going to go back to some uh, trials and tribulations. And as I started to say that opening up, that beginning to make myself available to the public, even though the public hasn't <laughs> really beaten down a path to my door, to be put it mildly. But I think I'm not ready yet. Because when I go out and about, I found myself just overwhelmed by the energies. I'm, I'm so receptive. Hey, if I look you in the eyes, I can see your karma. I can see your fears. I can see your shortcomings. I can see your shoulda, coulda, wouldas. I can see your uh, regrets. It's all there, writ large. And what I'm learning to do through the process of working on my chakras, wearing the different bracelets and malas that my wife has constructed for me, uh, and doing meditations that concentrate on chakras. Uh, chakras is nothing more than an energy wheel. If I go like this, I can really feel them. Two in her, two in her hands, I can feel them in the soles of my feet. But people think of the seven chakras when I know that the number is much greater. It's seven chakras within our realm of experience, but there's chakras of love and below. But again, chakra just means energy. We are, just as yoga, people ask me, do I practice yoga? And yoga just means action. That's all it means. And there's a million kinds of yoga. And I know that the yoga that I practice is there's four yogas for pursuit. It, 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 it's you can one size doesn't fit all. Four yo four yogas, four jhana yoga, which I chose. This is path from information to knowledge to wisdom. It's the of the intellect. It's of appeals to the scholar, to the thinker, to the researcher. There's bhakti yoga, which is chanting the name 
chanting the name sutras and chanting the name of your teacher and being in bliss and just totally absorbed in the celebration of your teacher. Then there's karma yoga, action, karma again. Union, I'm, I'm sorry, I had it backwards. Karma just means union. I mean, <laughs> get it right now. This. Yoga means union. Karma means action. I had it. Sorry. So there's the karmic, yog karmic yogi who practices good deeds. Deeds gone uh, anonymously. Deeds gone. Deeds of. Just the gift of helping others without seeking any thing in return and then there's the royal yoga the yoga of kings and another title escapes me again and I'll come back to it again so again karma is action yoga is union so there's four you four different union sources to figure out which is best for you, to experiment, to is best with you. Uh, Shakti Yoga, is that right? I'll look it up anyway, it doesn't matter. I, I know mine and that's, you, you, you know, you can look up the four yogas uh, and customize for yourself. You need to do a lot of looking and testing and trying and seeing what size this fits you. But again, <laughs> I'm getting away because I'm maybe not, I might be comfortable, not comfortable talking about feeling vulnerable, going outside and absorbing the energies from everything and bringing it home and not knowing how to properly well, I do know, but not currently practicing diligently enough of using the violent consuming flame, which not only consumes karma, but it consumes all the rubbish that you pick up from the outside world. We're sponges. Buddhas are like a super sponge. Uh, and my wife buys these little things called super sponges and it makes me laugh because it's super clean. You got a tea cup, this stain, a coffee cup, this super. <laughs> Here we go. I'm losing words today. But the super sponge and Buddhas were all super sponges and all of us truly absorb everything, everything we've been everything that has been will be is known we know right now at this moment all of us do it's just fortunate we have these filters these built-in filters that protect us and this is a protection that i'm looking for to not feel so vulnerable <laughs> my wife is laughing i love my brother but he's this too super energy being and i come back we go on bike rides and i'm charged up and I'm full of energy that's not mine because I'm an energyless being and if you don't understand what that means well it just means that I'm here to work a couple hours a day and the rest of the time is I'm here to rest and other people are here to work 24 7 if they don't work themselves literally to death they'll die of boredom <laughs> they won't sleep to suffer from insomnia they have to burn it up this seemingless seemingly bottomless well of energy. So I come home and I'm all plugged up and my wife just kind of goes, <laughs> time out, you know, go meditate for a while. Uh, you got the energy, it's just overwhelming, you know. Uh, go sit down, give me a break. <laughs> come back and talk to me when you've uh, mastered this, when you've disposed of this unwanted and excess energy of the energetic influences that the world around me can have. And I know my whole practice is, going, is based on my, all my verbal teachings will be about using the violet consuming flame and using protection and uh, 
if I probably go right here. My wife took my yellow one. She liked, but uh, yellow is the solar plexus, but I have green for the heart and orange with the cutest turtle. I don't know if you can see. Orange is the sacro. So it starts off red is the root, which I'm solid foundation. I have a solid bottom and a solid top. Heart needs work to be more compassionate. I'm a judgmental being, always have been and works. This is one of the things that I struggle hardest with overcoming. Uh, and then the energy of the sacral. So I know the solutions to my own, but I went through a period, this period of uh, time, it was my time to be vulnerable. And it's surprise, surprise. I'm looking forward to filling my small little hall. I've already set my goal. If I have 12 diligent students, that's a mastermind. 12 plus 1. 12 plus the master. Jesus had 12 disciples. It makes this concept called mastermind. So if I can develop 12 close, 12 beings that accept me, that recognize me, and that are responsive to my teachings, that will support me, nurture me, uh, protect me. That's all I'm looking for. The rest is extra. The rest is pudding. The rest, the rest is icing on the cake. And now I have two, two solid. It looks like the third is coming along. Looks like. Time will tell. But this again, it's not up to me. The universe will bring this to me. I go and I sit in my chair and I meditate and make myself available. And uh, between the blessing of COVID and in that people don't want to congregate. So it allows me a time to fulfill my commitment, which is to open, to sit, to be available. That's my commitment. That's all that's within my purview, my control, my list of responsibilities. And I'm doing that. But I can already see that if I open up myself up to too many people, which is not going to I don't think I have to worry about that. <laughs> Probably the least of my worries is to be open to too many people. But what to do with the people that I am open to? So I just wanted to share that I've been struggling. And it's reflected in the empty zendo and i think my zendo is full i can already feel the presence of people and i can certainly feel that small space i certainly can expand myself i can expand myself infinitely so not much challenge to fill a small room and that's what i have now it's i don't see anybody in there <laughs> but that doesn't mean they're not there i think they're there But that's my times of vulnerability. And my response to this vulnerability is first protection, and then meditation, focusing on the chakras, the energy centers that will help to the smooth transition. Sometimes I, 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 my crown chakra is wide open, and I receive everything from the infinite and sometimes my base is really solid so I feel the, all the nurturing the water the roots that are like a plant that goes into the soil it anchors you it sustains you it nurtures you I feel that I feel this and it gets to now it goes all the way to the blue Buddha and then the heart, the solar plexus, the sacral, and in the solar plexus, and in the, especially in the 
sacral. Sacral is divided to two sides that I've discovered. Not really, they're like sub chakras. One is the emotion. I'm not an emotive person. I'm not an emotional wheel. I don't have to wait 30 days. I don't, I'm not tied to the moon to make 30 days to ruminate, ruminate over decision-making process. I have the liver side. This is the spleen, the splenic, the survival, the instinctual survival that I know in the moment this soft voice speaks only once. So you must train yourself if you're a sacropene if, if I'm not a sacral being, if you're a splenic being, if your intuition, if you are psychic, intu intuitive, the, this side is probably, and this is the oldest center that we have because we share this with all animals. It's the instinct. The instinct that allows the survival of the species. This is the Instinct that allows the survival of this moi individual at any given time. So I know the solutions, but it doesn't, pre it doesn't, I still have to go through them. I still have to remind, I still have to practice. And this going to the violet consuming flame on a daily basis and expanding it, which again will be the only teachings that I'm going to verbalize. Kiss. Keep it simple, stupid. Kiss. Just about celebrating, utilizing, understanding the violet consuming flame because it just will take care of everything. It will take care of getting rid of the excess karma, getting rid of the excess feelings. I don't have spikes of emotion. If you have some ups and downs, really I'm a middle guy. It's not that there's not a cycle, but it's not this. It's almost imperceptible. But it doesn't take much. I'm more sensitive to someone else that's emotional, someone else that's energetic, and I just amplify. So one of the things about not being a emotional person not being on the emotional wave when you're encounter it about 70 percent of the people are both sacral and inner in, in, in emotional they have an endless source of energy and they have an endless source of emotive states they're in a turmoil constant state of changing that are tied to the cycle of the moon the 28 day cycle of the moon and they have to wait, they have to be patient and wait through a full cycle to make uh, any kind of major decision, of course. Uh, and when I find myself caught up in this, I don't have to look far to say, oh, I, that someone's influencing me in a negative way and I need to work on it. So this is the times of vulnerability that I'm sharing with you. But maybe what helps me, maybe what separates me from many others, if anything at all, and I'm not denying our commonality, our, our bond, our oneness, but I do believe there's levels of awareness and there's levels that you can be privy to that, and that you're more sensitive to and that you're more prepared. It doesn't keep them from happening, but it helps you to well, maybe make them occur less often, but certainly it'll help you deal with them in the moment, in the now. So, there's always a silver lining. COVID is my silver lining. Social distancing, isolation. Uh, yeah, it's what I need right now as I make myself stronger. 
It's not about protecting ourselves like isolation, social, protecting ourselves from the virus. It's different. It's accepting, I guess it's kind of like taking a vaccine. <laughs> the vaccine is supposed to make you more resistant. So just as my chakra, as my malas, as my meditation makes me, it's an aura of protection. And I think that vulnerability is there so that I'm aware in the moment that there's always work to do. You've got to be vigilant. I love that word, vigilant. You have to be vigilant. I have two cats and I watch them, and especially the little one, the female one. She's the apex hunter. <laughs> My guy is a guy. He just wants to eat and lay around, get fat. My girl is a huntress. She's the matriarch. But she just lollygag and lay in the sun. She loves to soak up the sun. But man, when it's time to boom, then she acts. And this is what my practice needs. When I'm feeling vulnerable, boom! Be vigilant, be aware, be proactive, be active, not reactive. When I'm feeling vulnerable, that's a reaction. When I'm aware that I'm getting it, but I'm constantly on my toes, constantly on the alert to battle them with the tools that I've been gifted with. And primarily, again, the violet consuming flame. And part of this vigilance, I have to talk about, if we talk about the third eye, and I've mentioned before, again, this is like a booty year. <laughs> this is like my message says 7,000 awakened Buddhas, fully aware Buddhas, are on this planet right now. One one hundredth of one percent, or one tenth of one percent of the population is the specific formula that was given. Where it came from? I don't know. Buddha years, where it came from? <laughs> I don't know. The fourth eye. The 360 degree vision, the peripheral vision, my peripheral vision just kept expanding until all of a sudden I said, well, I got eyes behind my head. They all say, it must not have been unheard of, otherwise there wouldn't be a folk tale about eyes in the back of your head. There's an eye, and mine's open. And I'm sometimes more sensitive. <laughs> you know, you're supposed to go forward, but you, you can't ignore what's what you've left behind, too. Might be sneaking up on you, for all you know. So be alert, be aware, be vigilant, and most importantly, and I'm leaning forward on purpose, most importantly is to be full of life, full of love, full of brotherhood and sisterhood, and awareness of our link.